Well, good morning, New Life Church. Man, it's so good to be hanging out in Heber Springs. I always love when I get to come to Heber. I'll tell you guys the same thing I told the first service, though. I have to apologize to you. I, I got to, right out of the gate, I got to apologize to you. I've accidentally, I didn't mean to, but I've accidentally told a lie to you the last couple of times I've been here. Here's the lie. I told you guys you had the best view in all of New Life Church. Now, before you throw something at me, let me explain it, okay? What I realized on the way up here this morning is the best view in all of, in all of New Life Church is actually wherever my wife and my kids are. But, you know, you guys do have the second best view in all of New Life Church, for sure. Um, but we are talking about family this morning. And uh, Jamie and I, we celebrated 17 years of marriage together this year. A few months ago, thank you. Been together for 20 in fact, I brought a picture to show you how it started. Yeah, it was that long ago. So long ago, it's blurry. Um, <laughs> we're not perfect, but we are perfect for each other. But I also brought you a picture to show you how it's going these days. Yeah, four kids and many adventures later. In fact, a guy, I used to teach at a university, and a, a guy that I teach with, he saw a picture of our family, and he was like, huh, four kids, huh, you must really like kids. I said, no, I really like my wife. <laughs> The, and amen, there we go. The, <laughs> the comedian Jim Gaffigan, he asked somebody one time, hey, you want to know what it's like having four kids? He said, imagine you're drowning and somebody hands you a baby. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought that joke was a lot funnier when we still had three kids, but... Anyways, hey, we are in this Ephesians series. Welcome this morning. And I want to let you know right out of the gate, hey, this is, not, this is not a marriage talk this morning. It's also not a parenting talk this morning. What it is, is this is a family talk. And Ephesians has a lot to teach us about how to, to live as a strong family. Um, and families in our nation are in real trouble. Uh, God's people, that's us, we've got to get this right. Now, I know you'll all remember this because you lived through it just like I did. But four years ago, smack dab in the middle of all the COVID shutdowns and quarantines and all that kind of stuff... Of course, we have four kids. My niece was also living with us at the time. So we just had a house full of people. And my wife and I were teaching at a university as well as leading one of our, our campuses. And everything that we did, life just kind of had shut down. So we were home all the time. And I don't know if anybody else found themselves getting a little too grumpy every once in a while back then. But um, one day, my youngest son, Matthew, he was three at the time. He looks up at me one day. I was probably being a little grumpy. And Matthew was like, Daddy, you need a timeout. <laughs> So in answer to that, I bought a mountain bike. And like, like I love my family every day. I, I love them every day. But I don't always like being with them all of every day. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Daddy needed a timeout. So um, I bought a mountain bike. But anybody in here, have you ever been like snow skiing or snowboarding before? Anybody who's done that? Yeah, a few of you. Um, Jamie and I, we used to do a lot of that. We'd take teams and, and, and groups of, of students to go do that. What I didn't know when I bought my mountain bike, though, was that they rate these mountain biking trails with the same classification system that they use for ski slopes. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a color system. And so from, like, easiest to hardest, it goes green, blue, black, and double black. So green is, like, the easy stuff. Blue is the challenging stuff. Black is the stuff for people... Uh, in the Red Bull commercials, and then double black is for people in a hurry to meet Jesus. <laughs> so I got my bike, and I immediately go straight to these trails that are like three minutes from our house. I didn't know they had this rating system, and I hadn't been on a bike in 22 years. At 39 years old, I went straight to the part where you're just jumping off the sides of mountains. It was awesome. Uh, except that that trail that I decided to go to happened to be blue, as in like the challenging stuff. <laughs> How do you think that went for me? <laughs> it wasn't great. I did remember the important stuff like where the brakes are and how to turn the pedals and that kind of thing. But I got to the very first major turn in this trail church. I wiped out hard, like really hard. So later I was asking my buddy Johnny, hey, give me some tips for mountain biking. And I learned something very important about mountain biking that applies to, to family. Uh, he told me, he said, the bike goes where you're looking. The bike goes where you're looking. And listen, this is a little strong, but I'm not sorry for it. We've got to learn to stop making excuses in our families and start focusing on where we're going. So the question I have for you this morning is, what are you focused on in your family? What are you focused on in your family? Because that is where you're leading your family. 
So where do you want to lead them? Where, where do you want your family to be in 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 years? Because you get a vote. Every day you get a vote. You get to decide where you're leading your family. And decisions are so important. Now, every time Jamie and I go on a date, this is what happens. I, I look at this beautiful woman of mine, and I ask her a question that strikes fear into the heart of every indecisive person. Where do you want to go? <laughs> it's funny because it's true. In fact, I would ask all the indecisive people in here to raise your hand, but you'd have trouble deciding if you're indecisive or not. And, and like choosing where to eat or like what movie to see on a date, you know, that's one thing. But deciding how you're going to lead your family, something else entirely, and you have to decide. So I'll ask you the same thing I've been asking Wonder Woman for 20 years. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? I'm so glad, aren't you glad, that Scripture tells us where to aim when it comes to leading our family. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, says this. It says, follow God's example. And truthfully, we could kind of stop right there, and that's enough. But we're going to keep going. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So when it comes to leading your family this morning, we're going to talk about three points. The first one today is set the example. You set the example. You have to decide where do you want your family to go. And if you don't decide where you want your family to go, something else or someone else will. And the truth is we make plans for stuff all the time. We make plans for our businesses. We make plans on like where we want to go on vacation. We dream these big dreams about, you know, the grand things that we want to do all the time. So why don't we have a dream and a purpose and a plan for our family? I, it's a travesty, really. Like so many families are, are just like they're just in survival mode trying to survive or or they're just trying to get along or, or maybe they're hoping that somebody else will come along and solve their problems. And truthfully, there's a lot of evidence out there right now for how this is impacting so many different things in our world because the family has been in decline in our nation now for 50 years. And things have gotten kind of weird, right? There's a lot of confusion even about what family looks like these days. There's a lot of confusion about people's expectations within the family. People, they maybe even doubt their role within the family. Or, you know, some people carry blame for things uh, that have gone wrong, or maybe kids are battling the shame of their parents' failures, or, or perhaps bitterness has affected spouses that are supposed to be enjoying their golden years together. Families are facing a lot of problems right now. And it's easy to, to want to blame those things, but the truth is, is those problems I just talked about aren't the real problems. They're the results of the real problem. In other words, we don't have like a culture problem in our families. We have a leadership problem. And I'm warning you guys, this is super strong this morning, okay? It's strong, though, because I needed to be reminded of how important this is. Uh, when I told Jamie what I was preaching about, she was like, oh, good, you're preaching to yourself. <laughs> I said something I learned 17 years ago. Yes, ma'am. But have you ever thought of yourself as a leader, especially in the context of your family? Have you ever thought about that? And it doesn't matter if you're the mom or the dad or a parent or a child. You are a leader in your house. And I love what Pastor Rick, our founding pastor, his, his good friend John Maxwell is a leadership guru. He had this to say when he defined leadership. He said, leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less. The influence you have in your home, that's your your leadership, and nobody is more important. No one you influence is more important than your family. Nobody's harder to influence either. We got to get this right. And, and getting toddlers to obey, that's a serious challenge. Getting on the same page as your spouse, that can be pretty tough too, but the hardest person that you are ever going to lead is that person staring back at you while you're brushing your teeth. It's the one in your mirror. You got to set the example that you want to set. And what I'm trying to share with you this morning is a lot of the things that I have to continuously remind myself of. You know what I know about you? I don't know all of you, but I know this about you, is you want to get this right. You want to lead your family well. But it starts with you. So 
What are going to be the guiding principles for how you decide to guide yourself and to lead yourself? And as a result of that, your family. What are the family values that you're going to make decisions by? This applies to everybody. Certainly the, the fathers, but mom and kids, you have a role in this too. It doesn't matter if your family is like ours and all the kids are still at home or if you're empty nesters, if you're somewhere in between. It doesn't matter if you're a nuclear family, if you're a single parent, or if you're a blended family. You set the terms. You set the example. And all of this comes with its own set of challenges. But our solution is we have to keep moving toward Jesus. And as you do, so will your family. It's not your job to live their life for them. It's your job to live yours, to set the example, and they will follow you as you move closer to Christ. So what we're going to do with the rest of our time this morning, hopefully, is we're going to walk through some very practical ways to apply this. All right? Ephesians 5.21. It says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. When it comes to leading our family, what does that mean? It means put each other first. Put each other first. And there's a few different ways that we walk this out. The first one, when it comes to putting each other first, it means have the right attitude. Have the right attitude about your family. And and having the right attitude is like, it deals with setting the temperature in your home. Anybody in here, you ever fight over the thermostat? Like, is our house gonna be hot? Is it gonna be cold? Uh, you know, the truth is Jamie and I, we've never fought over the thermostat. Like, I thank God every day he sent me a woman that gets just as cold as I do. <laughs> and when you choose your temperature in your home, when you're choosing your attitude, you are choosing the direction you're going to lead your family in. You're setting the example by choosing how you are deciding to live. You're setting the example by choosing how you talk about one another. You're setting the example by choosing how do you respond to the things around you. And you're setting an example by choosing how you think about one another. You're setting an example. Which brings us right to the next thing about how we can, uh, how we can put each other first. Which is this. Assuming the best about one another. Assume the best about each other. You know what? Sometimes my wife gets on my nerves. Frequently, I aggravate her. That's real talk. That's real marriage right there. And, it, and you know, in both the big stuff and the small stuff, what we've learned is we always assume the best about each other. Like, I never doubt her intentions or how she feels about me. I never question Jamie's commitment to our relationship. Never. How can I stand up here for all these people and say that? Because I know she has my best interest in mind. She's been proving it for 17 years, but guess what? We stood at an altar 17 years ago and agreed to do it that way on day one. Now, when Jamie and I, when we got married, I was so broke I couldn't afford a wedding band. She did have an engagement ring, but not a wedding band. And a couple of years later, we were doing a little better. I decided we were going to buy her a wedding band for our anniversary. And we were excited. It was a beautiful ring. We are really proud of it. And then nine years ago, she lost it. <laughs> Now, did that bother me? You bet. Guess what? It bothered her more because it was important to her. Well, fast forward, and a couple years ago, we were remodeling our house. We were getting ready to move to Conway, and I was tearing up this floor. And wouldn't you know it, under this floor that I installed, I found her wedding band. (laughs) Listen, assuming the best means looking beyond the details. It means remembering, hey, what's under the surface? Ultimately, what it comes down to is it's about trusting your spouse. And you might be in here this morning, and your road so far in your family has been bumpy. You know, trust may have become really difficult. Uh, You cannot compromise on trust in your marriage. You can't. You must be able to assume the best about the person that you're married to. You have to be able to assume the best about each other. In other words, you have to be someone that can be trusted and someone that can be trusting. It takes both to make it work when you assume the best about each other. And when you do this, what it does is it fosters a, uh, a family culture of understanding and support and leadership, one that's built on loving and cherishing each other. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and 24 in the Message Bible, it says this, Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church. Okay, and this part is super important. Don't miss this. Not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Guys, we have a leadership role to take here. And this isn't some kind of sexist male dominance thing because marriages like that, they are always weak, broken, and toxic. It takes a weak man to dominate his wife. It also takes a weak woman, though, to browbeat her husband. If you cherish something, you protect it. If you cherish something, you take care of it. Why? Because its well-being is vitally important to you. The way that we treat our family, it speaks volumes, right? It reveals how much we cherish them. We were remodeling that house I was talking about a couple years ago, getting ready to move to Conway, and I decided I was going to do all the work because I'm stupid. (laughs) Actually, it's because I'm cheap, but... (laughs) I finished our Saturday uh, one after, or I finished our living room one Saturday afternoon, and I looked up and I was like, "Man, I really like this. I should have done this years ago." The truth is, though, if I would have really cherished that room, I would have done it years ago. Church, listen, don't don't have a like a "I should have done this years ago" kind of moment when it comes to investing in your family. We we help a lot of people get through tough times in their marriages. And there's way too many people out there who wait until everything is failing and falling apart before they try to build a strong family. Don't be like that. Ephesians 5, verses 25, 28, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in this same way. Everybody say same In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. The third way that we lead our family is to love like Jesus. Love like Jesus. What did Jesus do? He initiated love. What does that mean for you and me? That means you go first. Set the example And loving like Jesus, it it means a couple of things we're going to talk through. Loving like Jesus, the first thing it means is that we live with grace and truth. In other words, you got to have unmovable convictions. And, not or, but and shocking love. Anybody in here, you have any convictions about something? Yeah, you stand on some things, right? Like we all have convictions. We have deeply held convictions about the things that matter the most to us. You've got convictions about good and evil. You've got convictions about what you think is right and wrong. You've got convictions about whether a steak should be rare or ruined. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm a pansy. I, I can't go past medium rare. Anyways, Frederick Douglass, he said this. He said, it's easier to build strong children than to, pro- than to repair broken men. Loving like Jesus, it means setting the example in your convictions. Develop your family values. Write them down. In the King Casa, we have a very clear set of family values. My kids know them. We repeat them all the time. And those are mine and Jamie's convictions. They're the things we want them to know that guide their life. And why that's so important, whether you write them down or not, you better know them because a house without convictions is a vacuum. And do you know what kind of convictions develop in a house like that? Godless convictions. All the disastrous ideas of our day are the byproduct of of convictions that are developed outside of God. We have to have unmovable convictions, and they're critical. But we also have to have shocking love because we have problems that pop up in our families, right? Why are we surprised when we have problems? You know, do you ever get in trouble by yourself? (laughs) Of course you do. Like, you can get in trouble all by yourself. There was a movie about that. It shouldn't surprise anybody in here that trouble shows up more in family because family magnifies flaws. So here's what I'm going to do. I thought it'd be fun to just have this brief exercise where I'm going to read everything to you in Scripture about the perfect family. Are you ready? 
Here we go. Yeah. There isn't one. Nothing, not a no perfect families in scripture, not one. And the truth is there's no perfect kids these days. There's no perfect parents, right? And I, I get, look, it can be a little tense when we start talking about this kind of stuff. So we're going to ease the tension in the room for a moment, all right? Will you guys do something with me? If you're married in the house, help me out. Repeat this after me. Are you ready? Okay, repeat this. If you're married, I am an imperfect person. Married to an imperfect person. All right, if you're a parent in here, I am an imperfect person. Raising an imperfect person. All the kids in here thought they were going to get off scot-free. No. Listen, if you're living with your family, if you're living with roommates, or if you're living all by yourself, repeat this one. I am living with an imperfect person. (laughs) Loving like Jesus, it means having those unmovable convictions. It also means shocking love. Jamie and I, we were trying to help this lady years ago who was really struggling in her marriage, and she would not stop talking about all the ways that her husband had wronged her. And this lady, listen, she was right about the truth of the situation, but she was wrong about how to move forward. Forgiveness is the only way to build a strong family. And when I looked at this lady, I told her, hey, you got to forgive. She was so mad at me. She blurted out, then I won't have anything to hold on to. That's right. That's the point. 1 Corinthians 13 is often called the love chapter. If you've been to a wedding in the last three years, you've probably heard it. Uh, Verse 5 doesn't mention love, but it's implied by the previous verses. And here's what it says. Love does not act improperly, is not selfish, is not provoked, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Church, stop keeping score. Stop keeping score. Healthy families, they don't keep score of each other's failures, like big or small. Stop nagging him about the toilet seat and that light he said he would fix. Dude, stop giving her a hard time about the new shoes she bought or whatever. Yeah, the little stuff matters, but your family, it matters so much more. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 with me. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Family is messy. And also, don't compare your mess to somebody else's fake masterpiece, especially by looking at social media. Nobody is ever going to post that picture about the time their kid filled up their car seat with explosive diarrhea. No mom you know is going to put put that picture on Instagram or that note she got from the teacher because little Johnny decided to ninja kick his buddy off the top of the slide. (laughs) It's not going to happen. But but we do need some perfect help when it comes to leading our families. And there's only one perfect parent out there, and you're not married to them. Not a good time for an amen. (laughs) One night, Jamie and I, we, we heard a noise in the garage. She elbowed me awake. Hey, go check that out. It sounded like all the big heavy tools in my garage had just decided to jump off the shelf at the same time. And so I stumbled down the stairs with my bed head and my Glock and uh, got to the garage. And there wasn't a, I didn't find a bad guy breaking into our cars. What I found was a squirrel turning over paint cans. But listen, we can't get distracted. We have to know who the real enemy is. Know who's really trying to break into your house. Know who's really trying to turn over the stuff at your family's table. Take it to the Lord. Wives, it's not your husband. Dude, it's not your bride. Kids, it's not your parents. Parents, it's not your kids. Love them like Jesus. Unmovable convictions and shocking love. And loving them like Jesus, the next thing it means for us, it's one word. Sacrifice. Now, I'm looking out across this room, and I, I know there's a lot of people there doing, they're acing this. You get up early. You go to a work at a job that's tough. And you're bringing home and you're providing, you sacrifice constantly. Here's a question I love to ask myself. It helps me remember what, what sacrifice can mean sometimes. In fact, I shared this with your men a couple of weeks ago when I was here. 
What does love require of me? What does love require of me? You know what I really uh, hate doing in my house? I hate doing the dishes. You know what I do almost every day in my house? (laughs) The dishes. Why? Because it's not fair that my bride that I love so much should be expected to handle all of that every day. And that might be a silly example. It probably is. In the grand scheme of life, that's a pretty small contribution, I know. But what love requires of me is that I do what I need to do. I love my wife more than I hate doing the dishes, so the choice is pretty easy. Ephesians 5.33, it says, However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. What does love require of me? Love requires me to do whatever I have to do to make it work. Whatever I have to do to make it work. Failure is not an option. My kids, they get one dad. I have to make it work. I can't afford to fail. My wife, she gets one husband. I can't afford to fail. I got to make it work. The crazy part, though, is that I fail all the time. That's why learning to say I'm sorry is so important. And it's why showing grace is essential. Unmovable convictions and shocking love. Jamie and I agreed years ago that if she ever decides to leave me, she has to take me with her. (laughs) Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. We're getting ready to land the plane, church. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, as we wrap this up, I want to talk really quickly about the three stages of the family relationship. These aren't in your notes, but you can write them down if you want to. And this has more to do with parenting, this part, but... The first stage of the family relationship is the caretaker, where you got to keep the babies alive, right? Nobody's sleeping. You're changing diapers all the time. Sometimes it it can feel like a never-ending series of doctor's appointments. That's the first stage. And then the second stage of parenting is you're the coach. You're teaching them how to do the important stuff, how to tie your shoes and the right way to live and how to cook and respect people and listen. And, you know, it's like it's all those important critical things in life. And then at some point, Your kids are growing up and you become their cheerleader. And you're watching them go through life just in awe of who they are. Like, wow, look at them. That is so incredible. I love them so much. So it's the the caretaker, the coach, and then the cheerleader. But what becomes very difficult is that some, there's some moment in life where these begin to change. And then as a, as a, not as a parent, but as a child, you begin to live these same three stages out with your parents, but in reverse. I'm living this right now. So in other words, when you're a little kid, you see your parents and you're their cheerleaders. Like, man, they can do no wrong. They're, you're the, they're your superhero, right? And then at some point, you look at your parents and it hits all of us at some point in our lives and you, suddenly you've become their coach. Like you're trying to help them navigate through some stuff in life, teaching them how to use their iPhone <laughs> or whatever. How to, you're just trying to teach them how to remember to do the important stuff. And then we all land in that place, that stage of, of the family relationship where you become their caretaker. And maybe once again, it seems like a never ending series of, of doctor's appointments. Like you're just trying to help them live with a quality of life. It's hard. And what I believe about all of us in this room is that we're probably in either one or two of those stages of the family relationship as a parent and as a child. God wants to help you lead your family through that. What we have to do is trust him. Also acknowledging this, that you are not perfect and you're never going to be perfect. But guess what? You are perfect for your family. God sent them to you. He sent you to them. That is not some happy cosmic accident. So where are you leading them? 
Mom, stop beating yourself up because your kid isn't like somebody else's. Stepdad in the house, listen. Your role in your spouse's kid's life is not a happy accident. Jesus didn't grow up with his biological father, and he had a great dad. That turned out okay. Trust God. Trust God. Perfection isn't possible, but following Jesus is. So so where are you going? Set an example that leads your family to Jesus. They will follow you. Put each other first. They're going to follow you. Assume the best about each other. They're going to follow you. Love each other like Jesus did. They're going to follow you. And guess what? When you do that enough, do you know what happens? Do you know where you find yourself? Home. Home. And it's pretty amazing when you have a house that's built on grace and truth. Amen.